Well, coming now is another American hero, Colonel Oliver North. He is a combat Marine with 22 years of service. His awards for service in combat include the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, and two Purple Hearts for Wounds in combat. He is a syndicated columnist today, the host of War Stories on the Fox News Channel, and all 11 of his books are New York Times bestsellers. He is the founder of Freedom Alliance. This is a foundation that provides college scholarships for the sons and daughters of service members killed in action. Yet he claims his most important accomplishment is to be the husband of one, the father of four, the grandfather of 12. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome an American success story on every level, Colonel Oliver North. Thank you all. Thank you, Gil. I, I news flash. Uh, just an update on that biography. Number 13 arrived yesterday. Uh, it, is, it is our uh, 13th grandchild, and it's our ninth grandson. And I give every one of our grandsons, not when they're born, but a little bit later, because their moms insisted on it. I give each one of them three presents and a note. The three presents are a shotgun, a Bible, and a note with a compass attached to it. And I say, if you learn to use all three, the shotgun, the Bible, and the compass, you will never be lost, you will never be hungry, and you need fear nothing, but you must learn to use all three. So number 13 will get his when he turns 12. Thank you for the chance to be with you this evening. I was hunting the other day with Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, your executive vice president, and he insisted that I not come and screw this up. I, I use this as an excuse to be here tonight because Fox gave me the option of being here or in Kandahar. And so I now get to postpone my departure for Kandahar for a few more days. Thank you for the opportunity to stand at the platform where Congressman Ryan, the next Vice President of the United States, stood earlier today. <laughs> After following, you know, I always used to get the tough acts to follow when I worked at the White House. I, I used to have to follow a fellow by the name of Reagan. <laughs> oh, well, you tell him, Holly. And it was, it, it was the hardest job. Now I've got to follow Leo Johnson. Now, I tell the folks that I work with at Fox News that I've got the best job in broadcasting. I know Hannity thinks he does, but I really do, because my only beat are soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardsmen, and Marines, and law enforcement. That's all I cover. I don't have to run around after politicians waiting for them to say something memorable. I, I don't have to go out and wait for Brittany to shave some part of her body. I keep company with heroes. And I say those words to young people, and I realize I've just conjured up in the mind of a young person the vision of somebody wearing a spandex suit and a cape, because that's their idea of a hero. You just had a hero on the stage right here. Because you see, the, 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 definition, the definition of a hero is a person who puts themselves at risk for the benefit of others. It's not the person who just climbed a mountain single-handedly. It's not the guy who caught the pass in the end zone or scored the winning basket or drove home the winning run. A hero is a person who puts themselves at risk for the benefit of others. And so the heroes I'm going to go out and cover on my now 55th embed here in a matter of days are young men who wear flak jackets and helmets and combat boots and flight suits, and they put themselves at risk every single day for all of us. And I know there hasn't been much about national security or the military in this campaign this year, but I want to talk with you this evening about why that's an important value for America, too. Because you see, without them, our enemies, and we do have them, our enemies have a vote in every decision on war. They start them. We finish them. And we're supposed to finish them right. 
Well, they've got to vote too. And so I want to chat with you this evening about these young Americans that I'm privileged to cover. Now, something that's a parallel that exists is the fact that in the military and in the media, you both take casualties. The casualties occur very often in the media when they fall off their egos and land on their IQs, but it's still a casualty. <laughs> I mean, we've seen a lot of that this week. And of course, the casualties occur when bad people do terrible things, like happened in Benghazi, Libya, earlier this week. And like it's happening right this minute in Sana, Yemen, where US Marines flown into the country are now defending an embassy against an unprecedented assault almost anywhere in the world. The last time we had a US ambassador killed was in 1979, and it was in a place called Tehran. We had a US ambassador killed in 1979 in a place called Kabul. And when you look at those kinds of events happening, you have to look back at the leadership that was there. So I want to examine some of that, knowing that we're going to be nonpartisan. Tony told me, you cannot be partisan tonight, so I'm going to try very hard not to. I noticed Michelle Bachman was not partisan today. <laughs> In the 20 minutes that I have remaining, I want to just talk to you a little bit about these young Americans. Right this very minute, there are 2.4 million young Americans who have served in the line of duty in a war that's going on for 11 years. They are youngsters who volunteered to serve in the midst of great travail in this nation. The young Americans that I served with in a faraway long ago war called Vietnam were treated despicably when they came home. What happened to the Vietnam veterans should never, ever have happened and ought never, ever to happen again in America. The enemy that our troops confront today is committed in totality to their cause. They're suicidal, very much like the ones that my uncles faced in the Pacific campaigns of World War II. And they are in harm's way literally from the moment that they arrive in country to the time in which they get to go home. We hope that they'll never be in jeopardy from that cause here again like they were in 9-11-01. No military force in history is as competent as capable or as combat experienced as the one that we have serving our nation today and every branch of our service. And though the me media has not been as vicious to them as they were to those of us who served in Vietnam, they've certainly tried. A, Nova, excuse me, a Pulitzer Prize recipient, Chris Hedges at the New York Crimes and repeated in the Washington Compost, once described those who serve in our armed forces as nothing, and I'm quoting, poor kids from Mississippi, Texas, and Alabama who couldn't get a decent job or health insurance, so he joined the military because that's all we offered them. I've got news for you, Mr. Hedges, and anybody here from the Washington Compost or the Criminal Broadcast Service or the Nasty Broadcasting Company, you're dead wrong about those who serve our country today. I brought with me, I brought with me a few of the thousands of miles of footage I've shot since this day, 9-11-01. The one that we're recognizing with sadness in memorials all across this country earlier this week when it all began overseas again. This is what motivated most of them to join. On Monday, I was out in the same dove field that General Boykin and I had hunted the Saturday before with three of the wounded warriors from Walter Reed Bethesda. In the picture that shows four of us standing together, there's only one person with two legs attached, me. All the rest of them have lost both their legs. All of them came because of this. Even though they were in grade school when it happened, they volunteered to serve their country because of what happened then. The very first ones to go were these, special operators coming in from the north. And of course today, many of them are alive today because Great dogs have spotted the IEDs before they were able to step on them. Average age is 20 and a half in the conventional forces, about 23 in the special operations forces. They often go to war flying an aircraft like the one you see behind us in this special operations team taken last year when I was out on my last deployment to Afghanistan. That's an MI-17 Russian-built helicopter because we just don't have enough of our own out there. These scenes from combat show these young Americans committed 
to the fight of their lives. Every one of them is in harm's way. They are remarkable young Americans who have extraordinary courage and commitment, and they understand the nature of what they're up against. They know that at any moment it could all end terribly for them, and yet they re demonstrate remarkable faith and resiliency in the face of terrible adversaries. They have taught Muslim men how to treat Muslim women and children. They have become the protectors of Muslim women and children in ways that they have never seen before. That didn't happen with the Russians in Afghanistan. That happens with Americans in Afghanistan. They employ the most sophisticated weapons and equipment that the world has ever seen. They can take a life or save one with it because they've been so remarkably well trained. The kid who once wouldn't share a candy bar with his little brother will now give away his last drop of water to a wounded comrade, split his ammo with a mate in a firefight, and give his last MRE to a hungry Iraqi or Afghan kid. They still wear way too much gear on their back. They go to work today, it was in Kandahar, 115 degrees by noon. And this afternoon, there was a prayer service for the Marines that were killed by enemy incoming at a place that had never been attacked before in the entire time that I've been covering this war. Their professions of faith, when you see them gather in a prayer circle like this, are not youngsters going out on a football field. They are going into mortal combat against an enemy who intends to die. And to an extraordinary extent, they come from what we can only call homes committed to Judeo-Christian values. This is a Medal of Honor recipient, the only living Marine Medal of Honor recipient when he was the 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, the last unit that I was assigned to in the Marines. There's another virtue that these youngsters have, a value that is reflected in all of what they do, and that is, I can only describe it as Christian compassion. The scene you see right there was taken on the 6th of April. Baghdad is the smoke you see in the background, and the Marine unit, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, with which I was embedded, is engaged by a Republican Guards regiment. They're the lead element, the van, if you will, of an attack going up the eastern corridor toward Baghdad. They spun the vehicles around in the road so they put a little more offset between themselves and the RPGs that were flying toward them. The Marines start running up to reinforce their buddies who are engaged in the lead vehicles that are hit. And this United States Navy medical corpsman, the one you see in the middle of the frame carrying a wounded fighter on his back, rushes out in the battlefield to start pulling wounded Marines out of the fight, put battle dressings on them, and a helicopter lands in the road. And at this point, I'm standing on the ramp of the helicopter, not because I'm trying to get away, but a little bit better vision, and you've got 250 caliber machine guns on either side of you. This is the fourth fighter that he's carried off the battlefield on his own back, and what you can't see in this frame, because I didn't notice it until after the helicopter took off, is a Reuters news crew that sets up and they're tracking him, going back and forth carrying these wounded guys. And the helicopter takes off and he's running back into the gunfight and I'm trying to catch up to him. He's a tad younger than I am. And the Reuters news crew shouts out to him, Hey mate, what did you do that for? Didn't you notice that was an Iraqi? In other words, you stupid American. You just rescued an Iraqi Republican Guardsman. That's what's on his back right there. That's not a wounded Marine. Those are US military battle dressings, but that is a wounded Iraqi soldier who just moments ago had tried to kill him. He's badly wounded, and he's put the battle dressings on, and he carries him to the helicopter where he's treated exactly the same as the Marines. Inflatable tourniquets, shock blanket, IV started, and off they go to a field hospital. The corpsman looks over at the Reuters news crew and gives what I can only call in polite company a gesture. General Boykin will explain that to you later. <laughs> he gives him a gesture and says, didn't you notice he was wounded? That's what we do. We're Americans. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm trying very hard not to be partisan here this evening, but let me just, let me just tell you what brought me here this evening besides Tony and the general asking me to come. I wasn't kidding about that 13th grandchild. 
They deserve better. These young Americans serving in harm's way deserve better. And my grandchildren deserve better than a commander in chief garbed and as a Nobel laureate kowtowing to foreign potentates all over the world. They deserve better than that. We as a nation need to have a commander-in-chief who can name our enemies, not as extremists, but as radical Islam, and a commander-in-chief who is unafraid to use words like win and victory and mean it. That's what this nation needs. I would like to see a government where our future is not threatened by the secularists who promise to solve every problem, to solve every human need, but are unwilling to respect the sanctity of human life. How can it be that we've come to this in this country? Well, my friends, in part, we've come to this because not enough of us have been engaged in the process. A few months before he died, my friend Chuck Colson and I were sitting talking about the challenges of what was going to come out here in this election. And Chuck Colson said to me, if the 21 million believers who didn't go to the polls in 2008 stay home this time, our nation is doomed. Well, friends, I hope our nation isn't doomed. I, I hope that we can have a government that respects our sovereign borders, that, that doesn't suborn our wealth to the interests of foreign potentates, that doesn't have a globalist agenda. And um, a government that's not going to treat the young Americans who serve in harm's way like lab rats in a radical social experiment. A, a government that respects the idea that marriage is a union of one man and one woman. Yeah. The only people who can change that are we the people. We the people is not a political slogan in America. It's a challenge. It's a commitment. It's what we're supposed to be about. There was something aired down at a convention that occurred recently in Charlotte that said we all belong to the government. We don't belong to the government. The government belongs to us. When Tony and Jerry and I were youngsters. We raised our right hands and took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We swore that we would protect it against anybody who offended us, that we would bear true faith and allegiance to same, that we took the obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And we added the phrase, so help me God, at the end of it. That's the oath taken by every member of our Congress. That's the oath taken by every senator. That's the oath taken by every single one of the 2.4 million that are serving today, the 65,000 that are left in Afghanistan, the 10,000 that are in Kuwait, the 31,000 that are afloat out in the Indian Ocean, and in harm's way in places like Guatemala and El Salvador and Mexico and Nicaragua, trying to combat the scourge of drugs and narco-terrorism. They are in harm's way. They forfeited the affection of loved ones, the warmth of the family fire, and they've gone into harm's way as volunteers in the finest military the world's ever known. I look at that commitment and I say, isn't the least we can do is to turn out those who believe strongly in those values for an election on November 6th? The framers who crafted our Constitution were counting on we the people to hold government accountable. We the people who can accept God's gifts of freedom must also accept the responsibility of self-governance. The mainstream media says this election this year is not about social issues. And the mainstream media describes social issues, and I'm, I'm quoting now from that Washington Compost, like the definition of marriage or abortion, that's what they call it, I call it the sanctity of life, 
or even this business about religious freedom for certain institutions. Those are defined by our media as social issues. They are not social issues. They've stolen our lexicon. Those are moral and spiritual issues, and we need to stand up for them as such. I, I was looking for some glimmer of hope in what occurred down in, in Charlotte. I, I was looking for some defense of the First Amendment, some defense of the Second Amendment. I heard none of that. And again, knowing that this is not a partisan gathering, I would submit to you that there is only one candidate who's going to be able to defend not just the first and the second, but the entire Bill of Rights for the rest of us. And you saw his vice presidential candidate here today. I uh, was blessed to serve a president of the United States for five years in the White House, who did not hesitate to remind us what was right. Ronald Reagan was the first president, to my recollection, that said that the capital of Israel is Jerusalem. Interestingly enough, every party platform and every political party, except the libertarians, carried those same kinds of phrases in it until this year. This year, for reasons beyond my comprehension, one party struck those words, along with God, out of their party platform. They shall remain otherwise nameless, but they met in Charlotte. <laughs> and trying hard, Tony, to abide by the instructions. And so I was so incensed when I saw what they had done in Charlotte. I said, well, if they don't know where Jerusalem is, I will show them. And so I am going to go to Jerusalem and show them that Jerusalem is indeed the capital of Israel. And I'm going to go there in January. If you would like to join us on that, I think I've got a slide that shows it, but you go to OliverNorthIsrael.com and join me there. That was my last trip, right after another war in 2006, when they had been attacked by the Hezbollah, which is the recipient of aid from Iran through Syria. Does anybody see what's happening in the so-called Arab Spring? Mr. Obama, Arab Spring, how's that working for you? <laughs> My friends, if, if we want America to remain a global force for good, we're going to have to have leaders in Washington who will make sure that they do so. Ronald Reagan once said, and he said it vividly and repeatedly, that we have a rendezvous with destiny. A rendezvous with destiny does not occur on its own. I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in fate. I do believe in the power of prayer, and I don't believe that the good Lord put us here to watch the demise of the greatest force for good the world has ever known. America has got to remain not simply the land of the free, but the beacon of hope for the rest of the world. It will only do that, and we can only do that if all of you remind everyone else that we're also still the home of the brave. God bless you, and thank you for being here for this great summer. Thank you.